Today is day nine of our quadratics unit, and we're going to be talking about not just solving quadratic equations, but how to use completing the square to do it. So I've got ourselves set up here with a first example, and that is to solve um, for when f of x equals x squared minus 2x minus 8, when f of x equals 0. So we could have just put a zero in here, but I want you to think of it as a parabola, and therefore, like, what's the implication of when we say x f of x equals zero, right? So there's two ways that we can do this. The first way is, first of all, just put in zero first. So if we put in zero over here, this is something that we're really familiar with, the idea that we can just factor. So if it's factorable, and that's the key, is if we can say, all right, what adds to this, multiplies to this, this would go x minus 4, x plus 2. We would technically set each factor equal to 0, even though we tend to get lazy and not always show that. But we would end up with these two solutions right here. The second way is how we can use completing the square, which sometimes you're going to see abbreviated as CTS, right? So complete the square or CTS. All right, how do we do that? Well, let's put in here the zero still and x squared minus 2x minus 8. All right, now the completing the square steps, you would do exactly the same thing that we did for the first few steps um, as just trying to convert something into that vertex form. Just normally there'd be a y over here, All right? No big deal. So you get the x squared terms alone, which means I would add 8 to the other side. So if I add 8 over, I'm going to get 8 and then equals x squared minus 2x. All right, here comes the complete the square step. You take the b term, which in this case is that negative 2. I chop it in half and I square it. Well, either way, that's negative 1 squared. That comes out to just be 1. So I'd add 1 here, and then to balance, I would add 1 over here. From there, now, this guy I would factor. So even in completing the square, we still get some factoring going on in here. This would then factor into x minus 1 times x minus 1, or I can write it as x minus 1 squared. On the left-hand side, I'm just adding those two values. So 8 and 1 will give me 9. This is where the process looks different. At this point, now what you would do is once you get it to here, is we would actually take the square root and then solve for x. So once I can get it to something squared, I would take the square root of both sides. The square root of something squared, well, that's easy. That part just cancels and you're left with x minus 1. The little trick here, when you take the square root over here, you have to remember that you need the plus or the minus because it's not just three. It could be positive or negative three when we physically go in there and take that square root. All right. Then you have to finish the question. You're saying that x plus or excuse me, x minus one is either equal to positive three or negative three. So two different equations. Set it equal to positive three. Set it equal to negative three. All right. Let's solve. If I add one over, one answer would be x equals four. If I add one over here, the other answer comes out x equals negative two. So I get the same answers. In this case, did it take more work? Yeah. So if it's factorable, heck yeah, I would choose the factoring, right? But if it's not factorable, this is another method that you can actually use, right? Or even if it is factorable and you're like, I just like completing the square, go for it. Now I did say, what does this mean in terms of the actual parabola? Because if it's just an equation, well, then it's the solutions. If it's an actual parabola where this guy, if I graphed it, well, what are we talking about when we set it equal to zero or set y to zero? So whenever we set y equal to zero, right, that's finding the x-intercepts. And so if we graph this thing, what that means is that this parabola is crossing at the point 4, 0, and negative 2, 0. So it doesn't have to be an amazing sketch, but just give yourself a little sketch here that we would cross at 1, 2, 3, 4, and then back at negative 2. The fact that it was positive means we know it'll open up. So it'll look something like this. Now, if we wanted to know where exactly is the vertex, 
Well, we know how to get it into vertex form. We kind of did some of that work already. Um, if I wanted to, I could kind of like steal what I had done over here. Imagine that the Y was still in there, right? It would have been Y plus nine. If I kind of take it from this step, ooh, kind of borrowing, and I get the X minus one squared, the last step would have just been to move the nine back over. And the vertex based on this is that it's going to go to the right one and down nine. So that vertex point, mine is clearly not drawn to scale, but would be at one and then down here, this would be one negative nine, right? So you can kind of put all those little details together. If we're just worried about where, you know, we can solve it, we don't need this piece of it. This is if you're trying to do like the full graph, all right? So something that I want you to take note of right now is that to solve a quadratic equation, factoring, I'm going to say works sometimes to solve a quadratic equation. And if it works, of course, do it. But it doesn't always work. So you have to have other methods that you can use. Completing the square. Always works to solve a quadratic equation. So if you're like, well, I could have just factored it. Mm, factoring's, factoring's pretty. Factoring's when we get nice, pretty values. They're not always nice and pretty and fit the mold that we want. So if it doesn't work, then you got to have something else you can roll with. For me, I don't have enough space on this page. If you have more space, you can keep going. Um, the next example for me takes up about half of the page. So I'm going to hop on over to a new piece of paper so that I can keep going. So for example two, because that was really example run right there. Example two, I want to do the same thing. Let's solve for what we ultimately said are the x-intercepts of the equation f of x equaling x squared plus 10x minus 7. All right. Now, when you hit one like this, I would absolutely want you to first say, okay, well, if I'm looking for x-intercepts, that means set y equal to 0. And when I say y equal to 0, that's synonymous with set f of x equal to 0. So I can put a 0 in on the left and then x squared plus 10x minus 7. I would absolutely try to factor it first. So if you can factor it, do it. You might already look at this and go, okay, what adds to 10 multiplies to seven? Nothing, all right? So if factoring doesn't work, here's where completing the square is gonna come in. So to complete the square, get the X terms by themselves. So add the seven on over to the other side, so that you get seven, leave yourself a little space, and then equals x squared plus 10x. All right, the completing the square step, the term in front of the x, that's the b term. So you're gonna take b, divide it by two, and square it, and then that's what you're adding to both sides. So in this case, we're gonna take 10, cut it in half, and square it. That'll be five squared or 25. So we're gonna add 25 right here, and then always to balance it, add 25 on the other side there. Mm -hmm. This is now factorable. Right? So now we should be able to factor. So this factors into x plus 5 times x plus 5, because that was the goal, to make this a perfect square so that I can really write it as x plus 5 squared. All right? So you're factoring this piece of it. On the other side, 7 and 25 gives us 32. Okay. If we were getting it in a standard form, first of all, there'd still be a Y in here, but we're not. We are trying to solve. So this is the step now where we take the square root of both sides. All right, square root on the left, square root on the right. The easy part is the square root of something squared. Those are inverse operations. They just undo one another and you're left with the X plus five. Over here, now you have a radical we can simplify. So we have radical 16 
times radical 2 plus or minus, don't forget that part, so it's going to be plus or minus 4 and then radical 2 equals x plus 5. All right, that produces two separate answers. So let me subtract the 5 over first. Sometimes you're going to see the answers just written as negative 5 plus or minus 4 radical 2, and that's fine. But what that really means is that your two solutions, all right, is that x is equal to negative 5 plus 4 radical 2, and x is equal to negative 5 minus 4 radical 2. And if you're thinking, well, what, what the heck is that? Call the calculator. Grab your calculator real quick. If we grab it, we are going to have negative 5 and then plus 4 radical 2. Oops, just kidding. Let me actually put a number in there. Um, try that again. Put a 2 in there. All right, that's going to give me um, approximately, so I'll do the little approximate, 0. 0.6, let's say 6, 6. All right, we'll round it there. And then if I do negative 5 and then change this to a minus 4 radical 2, this answer is approximately negative 10, let's say 0. 0.66. So if you graph that particular parabola, we're going to see it hit the x-axis a little shy of 1 and a little bit to the left of 10. So I'm going to go into my y equals, clear out anything that I had in there from before, and then type this in. So if I do x squared plus 10x and then minus 7, zoom 6 should be a fairly decent window here. All right, if you look, there it's crossing right there at, um, that would be like the 0.66. Because I don't go all the way to 10 or past 10, I don't see it. So I will actually expand this window just a little bit. Maybe I'll make that like negative 12. And then while I'm at it, I'm going to lower my uh, Y minimum just so you guys can see better. You don't have to change it on yours if you don't want to. But here we go. There's that big old parabola right there. All right. Mm -hmm. And so I'll add a little sketch in my notes here that it's hitting here at 0.66 and then way back here at negative 10.66 approximately. And then we can kind of just sketch in the in-between. All right, so something to keep in mind. The last page, our answers came out pretty. Now, pretty is not a technical math term, but what it means is that back here on this last page, they came out as nice real numbers, right? Whole numbers that were rational values, right? Those are ways to describe these. These ones here, when you get that decimal that keeps going or a radical you can't simplify, it just means that you're ending up with irrational answers, which is certainly okay. But we're still getting what we would call two real answers. These are real numbers, right? They're just messy. That's all. All right, we have one last example to look at together. So let me slide on up. And example three, let's see if we can make that completing the square work one more time. Okay, this time um, we've got f of x equals 2x squared plus 16x plus 50. And again, we're going to solve for when f of x equals zero. So I can take and put a zero in here. Okay, now something cool that we can do with this. Completing the square only works when that leading term is a one. Since there's a two here, our first step is actually to divide the two out. And in this case, because there's a zero on the other side, it's not like you're gonna be stuck with the two. You're just gonna see it and it disappear, which seems weird, but into the problem. So we end up with zero and then equals x squared plus 8x plus 25. So we don't have to worry about it there. What that two essentially is, is a vertical stretch, but it's not going to affect our roots here. All right. If we now do completing the square, subtract the 25 over so that we get x squared plus 8x. Hopefully we're starting to get good at this. You can do the work off to the side if you need to. Cut it in half and square it. So that's going to be 4 squared or 16. I'm going to add 16 to one side and then balance it by adding it to the other side. All right. This is going to give me 
x plus 4 times x plus 4, or I can jump right to saying x plus 4 squared. 16 minus 25, that's going to give me a negative 9. All right. When I go to solve, I take the square root of both sides. Square root of x plus 4 squared is just x plus 4. Ooh, over here, here's where all that training from that mini little unit 5 comes in handy. It's radical 9, and you separate out the negative. So what we really end up here is plus or minus 3, and then that turns into i. So we still finish the question by subtracting the 4 on over. And so what we end up with is x is equal to negative 4 plus or minus 3i. That's the solution here. All right, what does that mean in terms of graphing it? Well, let's finish by going to the calculator. If I plug the original in, the 2x squared, oops, I'm sorry, 2x squared plus 16x plus 50. I'll leave the window that I had and take my chances here. Let's see. Uh-oh, I'm not seeing much of anything. Let me change my window so that I can look up. So the y maximum is 10. I'm going to make that like a 30. Let's go back and take a little gander here. Oh, there we go. All right, that parabola exists. It's not like it's the parabola is imaginary. What is imaginary are the roots. All right, so when I say the roots, I mean the x-intercepts. So the x-intercepts are imaginary. So when we finally spot that little parabola, what we notice is it's kind of floating up there in the second quadrant, and it doesn't hit the x-axis. So if the x-intercepts are imaginary, then what it means, right, is that the parabola, the parabola is very real, but it will not cross the x-axis. So that's what that means in terms of the picture that you end up with. So we can do the completing the square. It was actually pretty easy to do. This one would not have been factorable. So this is a great one to use completing the square for. And then when we get those imaginary answers, that is what we're looking at. All right. Awesome job. We'll do some more practice next time I see you. Go answer that post video question right now.